Hello, everybody. This is Trip, and uh, my friend, an open and relational theologian extraordinaire, Thomas J. Ward, is here, and we're about to have some fun because we were sent more questions than we'll get to from the wonderful world of the wide web. Um, and so, how do you feel about an open and relational theological Q and A, Tom? Uh, sounds good to me. It is. It's like you didn't just have a whole book come out just based on you answering questions. <laughs> yes, that's right. I think I, I get to about eight questions, but like uh, apparently your list, I could have had another hundred probably in that book. Yeah, some of them. W w so I'll, I'll put it this way. We're going to move from the average person might be interested in it, you know, like uh, given Trump's recent turn to process theology with uh, uh, God Hurts. <laughs> to uh like it'll become increasingly nerdy over time depending on Sounds how long good. it takes us to answer a question um but first and uh and actually even i just got a message about this from someone online but uh they asked they said they would uh this is tom who is currently dissertating uh so uh, about katherine keller um oh. said would love to hear more about the new program he's doing with Northwind and his vision for theological education post COVID. What's the point? How might it happen? Et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, maybe you can share a little bit about the new PhD program and then thinking about how theological education is changing and stuff in, uh, in, in the middle of a, a giant tornado. Yeah, sounds good. Well, I'm, I'm really enjoying my new work. I'm directing doctoral students in open and relational theology uh, through Northwind Theological Seminary, which is a startup seminary that's fully online. And um, what's really cool about, I think cool about the program is I'm working with students who want to pursue particular questions, issues, projects in the broad umbrella of open relational thinking. And so that means uh, reading lots of great text and then coming up with original proposals and projects to make uh, a contribution, not just to open a relational thinking, but uh, to the academy, the church and society at large. And um, what's cool is, you know, it's, it's tailored to each student. So I, a student applies, I look at what they've done in the past related to open and relational thought and what they'd like to do in the future. And then we just, read the greats, listen to podcasts like yours, pursue uh, books of various types and, um, and enjoy ourselves in the service of scholarship. Mm -hmm. in, in one of the, I mean, the other part of the question about how theological education is changing, I think this is, I mean, there's a couple elements in that, right? Like that um, in the States, uh, because of the constant changing nature uh, religion and spirituality and stuff, there are more and more people who are exploring theological education later in life who need different formats and different ways of putting it in their space. And also there are people who went to divinity school or in, in serving places, be it, you know, a civic organization, activism, a social service ministry or whatever. And then from that experience, a desire to reflect intentionally about, uh, you know, for theological reflection comes about. And so much of our normal format uh, isn't built for that, right? No, and, and so not. this type of format of the, 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 you know, the reading for a degree with the ongoing mentorship thing, I think really opens up the space to uh, get a graduate degree without kind of the, you know, making it fit either the practical intensive type or the uh, kind of, isolate yourself for an extended period of time and read dead people type. <laughs> right. I mean, I think that's one of the changes. There's much more greater understanding that scholarship can take different forms. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, writing a theoretical book necessarily, although there's still a place for that. But um, I think one of the big differences actually, uh, let me see, how should I say this without using names? Well, there are some major accrediting agencies that require things like having a physical library mm -hmm. or having a physical campus, 
which, you know, in 2020 seems really weird when we've got a really great online resources, online libraries. We don't need to have a building to, to do education. So there's those kind of technological changes going on in addition to recognizing the scholarship takes a number of different forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, if you didn't think we needed to think things through theologically prior to COVID <laughs> and uh, giant uh, rallies for justice across our nation and everything, then um, you might be considering it now. Um, th so one of the, uh, so, so how would someone follow up or connect with you? Like if they're, they're interested in exploring it or whatever, like. Yeah, they could probably get more info if they just Google Northwind Theological Seminary, but they could also send me a, an email. My email address is easily uh, accessible, but just if you can't find it, it's T-J-O-O-R-D at N-N-U dot E-D-U. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll give you the skinny. All right. So, um, all right. So, uh, it, it's dangerous to discuss our current president in the first question of anything <laughs> on a podcast. It <laughs> tends to lead me to derail in uh, all sorts of ways. But uh, this, this, this recent, I don't know what even you want to call it. Donald Trump has ignited theological Twitter because he either committed the heresy of patro passionism or he might be lapsing into process thought or gotten into Moltmann. Maybe he was reading God can't um, when he, when he said that, that, that someone could hurt God, namely Joe Biden could hurt God. Um, and yeah. And hurt the Bible. I think. Yeah. Here's really the quote interesting. because uh, I just want everyone to know, this I'm quoting the person with access to nuclear codes. Um, <laughs> in referring to a very devout Catholic, Joe Biden, who regularly talks about his Catholic faith and how it helped sustain him through the death of his wife and child. But nonetheless, he's following <laughs> the radical left agenda. Take away your guns, destroy your Second Amendment, no religion, no anything. Um which is funny. I, this is not what Trump said, which is funny given that the radical left agenda does include things like a planet three <laughs> generations from now and health care for everyone and living wages for all of the working class poor that don't know how they provide food on their plate. But let's just go ahead and say that he's narrowing his audience like a Calvinist <laughs> narrows the salvation given by the holy and loving god nonetheless um destroy your second amendment no religion no anything hurt the bible i didn't miss part of the sentence this is how he said it uh, no religion no anything hurt the bible hurt god he's against god he's against guns he's against energy our kind of energy <laughs> i'm not saying a joke i thought of that refers to a particular location connected to uh, lack of uh, of size in it because it would make Tom <laughs> Ward a Nazarene uncomfortable. But there are sometimes uh, like lowercase d energy. Um, it's, but that's not as energy is referring to because he's in Ohio because they have other kinds of energy. Um, Buckeye energy. <laughs> I don't think he's going to do too well in Ohio. Our president said that. And um and I don't know which which heresy's worse, you know? But of all the heresies that were in that, patropassionism is not the worst. <laughs> no. No, definitely not. It's obvious what he's doing. He's trying to rally his particular base. He's trying to say I'm on God's side and my opponent is against God. But it is interesting that he uses that language hurt God. <laughs> um I've had several people on Twitter, you know, come back and say, you know, no, the God I believe in is, you know, immutable, immovable, impassable, can't be affected by anything. There's no worries here and of course, as an open and relational theologian, um, I disagree. I'm not a Trump fan, but 
I do think God really is affected by the world. And strangely enough, in my particular view, uh, Donald Trump is hurting God. His policies are hurting God. His decisions are hurting God. Um, I don't think God's going to shrivel up and disappear. And, uh, but I do think what we do matters not only to us, not only to our society, not only to our planet, but even to the God of the universe. Mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in, and just to clarify, there are open and relational theologians who are Catholic, right? And, right. Um, and just having, I don't know, one very committed Catholic friend would probably lead you to recognize that they have a certain anxiety in American culture, namely around certain types of Protestants that don't recognize Catholics as actual Christians. Yeah. And when you were dismissing um, a a visibly devout Catholic for a large portion of his life, like person and saying that a Catholic doesn't, that hurts the Bible. Right. <laughs> and her Scott, like, like one of the most vehement parts of, of anti-Catholicism in Protestant Christianity is the assumption that having um, a robust uh, affirmation of the tradition and the uh, ecclesiastical structures and authority means you actually don't like the Bible. And if you, <laughs> one wants to listen yeah. to interviews, like even edgy Catholics, right? Like go listen to my interview with Roger Haight or Joseph Brackett, right? Like there's nothing about them that says they don't like the Bible. They actually quote it more than people who aren't celibate right. and chant it every day. <laughs> like, this, uh, that's the thing that always strikes me about people like, do we even count Trump as Protestant since he's never apologized to God yeah. about anything? Yeah. What does he hard. count it? He's but kind of like the church of first prosperity Yeah, without the gospels, just prosperity. <laughs> I think though, you know, just to look at Trump's, we'll call it Trump's strategy. I don't think he really strategizes. I think he shoots, for, <laughs> shoots from the hip left and right. But, you know, as much has been made about the fact that, 80 some percent of white evangelicals voted for Trump. Not a lot of people note that like two thirds of American Catholics voted for him. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he's got to rally that part of his base if he's going to get reelected. And I, I suspect that percentage will be significantly lower this next election. Well, he's also had four years of the Pope telling him he's working for the Antichrist, right? Like that always helps. Like, like yeah. there are things that like when, when Papa Francis is just like our current economic order exploits the planet and pillages the poor. And if you yeah. cooperate with it, you're working with demonic forces. Like and he says stuff like that, or like if you're trying to build walls between peoples, <laughs> like things like that, you're just like, Oh, We'll see what we'll see what conservative Catholics in America do. The the Catholics that used to criticize liberal Catholics for using birth control, et cetera, and say, you know, the Pope is against that. We'll see what they do when they know that the Pope is against their presidential candidate, which which they'll choose. That will be interesting. Well, one of the most uh funded posts on Facebook during the last election that was of Russian origin was a post about the about trump being endorsed by the pope oh i um, didn't know that and it was uh targeted towards people who are um not just catholic on facebook based on demogra like your demographic assessment by what you do but um uh politically energized catholics so russia had this fake article because francis never endorsed trump and <laughs> And then spent millions, or I don't know how much, large amounts of money getting, like, it was like 40 million views um, in the big swing states in the Midwest for Catholics that are politically energized, knowing, like, if they see it, they're more likely to share it and then repeat it. Um, anyway, but. You know, I think I have a suggestion for you. Why don't you have me back on your program and let's get Pope Francis on here. And I think between the two of us, we could make him an open and relational, dyed in the wool, open and relational theologian by the time we're done. I mean, he's I, almost there. He's very close. I know. And, and, uh, and then you got to think like, well, is that, is that strategic or not? Right? Like if he changes too much, 
then the super conservatives in the Catholic yeah. Church might hop on him because they're already trying to take him out. It's like yeah. he was oh, like yeah. affirming the value of all living things as uh, sharing in the goodness of God's decision uh, to create and bring about. Like, and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like the next yeah. thing you're going to say is Gaia. And Pope Francis is like, Gaia? That's got nothing on Genesis. <laughs> like, anyway, yep. the, you know, the, so the other part about the, the, the you know, Trump's quote that I think is really important is – the way he ties together a bunch of concepts in the kind of civic religion of America, and I'm interested in how you see, um, excuse me, open and relational theology engaging. Like, right? so he takes the whole hurt God, hurt the Bible, and it's connected to also being a gu- connected to guns, <laughs> energy, right? like energy, <laughs> um, and then the legal protection for guns. And energy, right? Like, so the same protection he's wanting, like, to give to religion, he thinks that's like immediately connected to guns, right? Yeah. And I think part of what open and relational theology shares across this m- multiplicity of expressions is an insistence that God's relational and loving nature is not one that thinks you can cling to guns and the Bible at the same time, right? Yeah. Like. And, and it's not like to minimize like like hunting or whatever. Like it's right, the right. red what it symbolizes rhetorically, yep. right? Is this autonomy, this private property as finality? Um, this it there is a logic where you take a life, um, and it should be available to everyone all the time, right? Like so, how do I, I don't know? To me, that makes me more uncomfortable than whatever brain fart he had that imagined <laughs> Joe Biden could hurt the Bible and hurt God. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Open and relational theologians generally are on the pacifist side of things. They emphasize nonviolence. There are some who endorse, you know, guns, et cetera, but they do so not as their lead point, not as their, you know, central platform or plank but uh, in a kind of a maybe of a just war kind of an approach. But open and relational folks believe that our first and second and third and fourth and fifth, et cetera, uh, actions are always toward de-escalation of violence, use of nonviolence, trying to choose the least amount of violence we think might be necessary because we think God is nonviolent. We think God is not in the business Um, So I could talk on and on about that, but it's just a a stark contrast between Donald Trump and open relational thinking. And and, and I would just say for those that, uh, especially on theological Twitter, were hung up that, you know, Trump would suggest God could hurt. Yeah. Um, If he hasn't already suggested things connected to religion that freaked you out, (laughs) <laughs> the one that's sad but the other side is now while those of us that are uh um you know process adjacent and connected uh have found metaphysical reasons to affirm that god hurts so that god shares in the experience yeah. of the world moment to moment um like process people aren't alone like open and relational theologies include right. others Right, like Jurgen Moltmann, and you have like social trinitarians that get at it. You have right. ecstatic naturalists that get at it a different way. Like there's there's a whole host. I'm, I'm supervising a dissertation right now on Wesley, and they're more conservative and very insistent, right, that Wesley isn't so compatible with process thought. But even Wesley, like, has very explicit places about God's Definitely. participation and presence in creation, and 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 I just think that there's a uh, like like to say something hurts God. You the and then to hear Trump say it and get offended, like that offended your Christianity just like when he said there's good people on both sides. Like <laughs> it is problematic. Like yeah. one, so many of his offensive statements have to do with a very like uh bigoted, nationalistic, uh, uh, uh like so many like ugly things. But to say that God hurts is a statement about divine solidarity. Right. Because God doesn't hurt 
as if God had a body. God hurts because God is invested and participates in all bodies. Right, right, right. And that God shows up with us deeply in a way that God shares the hurt is good news. That's not the only thing available to God, but it's not like God's desire for a moment, God's calling, God's lure, God's presence is something apart from really knowing the world as it is. It's as the one who knows it as it is deeply, truly, right. and completely that God comes to us and yep. works with us. So, I mean, like, when yes, Donald God Trump, hurts. Yeah, I think when Donald Trump says God hurts, what he really means is he thinks that Joe Biden is going to hurt a particular religious right, theological, or political agenda. He's not talking about God actually hurting. But I tell you, yeah. I, get, I get letters almost every week from people who've read my writings on the problem of evil and mm -hmm. found the idea that God can't prevent evil single-handedly helpful. But one of the other ideas that I propose is that God suffers with them in the midst of their struggles. So the idea that God hurts with them is a really profound idea for those who are victims of evil, uh, survivors of torture and abuse. And uh, that's, I think, a really important uh, notion at the center of open and relational thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if, Tom, God was, uh, had some controlling love available. Uh, Andrew on Twitter thinks it should get exercised on Donald Trump. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> if God could control, then uh, why doesn't God do something about yeah, not only Donald Trump, but the evils of the world? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it is a, uh, uh, it, it is problematic. So, you know, one of the other questions that, that um, I, I got DM'd said, uh, yeah, I've recently discovered the podcast, loved engaging with Ord uh, and thinking about open relational perspectives. Um, how does that framework uh, change the way you engage friends and family who are utterly confident about the way they see the world in particular around the intensities of this particular uh, political, hold on, my phone just went into black. Oh, particular political moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm wrestling with this in my own life and my own family members and the conversations that I have. Uh, I think that open relational believers affirm the interrelatedness of existence such that we must be vulnerable to others in a healthy kind of way. And for me, that's trying to discern at what time I should be engaging, listening carefully, uh, trying to empathize with those who have, let's say, a hard right perspective, mm -hmm. and those times in which it's healthier for me to disengage. And uh, I don't think it's one or the other. It's a continual process, at least for me, and I suspect for most people. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the perspectives I bring to these conversations. Another one is, trip just to remember my own history, you know. Um, I maybe was never as hard right as some of the people I talked to, but there was a time in my life when I was younger when I was much closer to them, and I've seen change occur. I've seen what I think of as genuine transformation. And so uh, sometimes it helps me to remember the old Tom in relation to the new Tom and to, it helps me imagine the possibility of transformation in others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, yeah, there's a particular element of it that I've, I find helping like in an open relational thought in any moment of becoming, you have like kind of like three different contributions to of power that exercise in a moment. There's a way God's lure or the possibilities are given, right? Mm -hmm. And God has a valuation of what is possible in the moment and mm -hmm. calls us to do the most beautiful, loving uh, thing. Um, and then there's your own agency, right? Like the way you relate to those possibilities, but all those things are shaped by the past and not just yeah. the past in some inert way, like it's one clunk, but also how you relate to that past. Mm. And if you are someone who's experienced change and transformation uh, 
in, in any kind of like big value centered conversation, religion, politics, all those types of uh, types of things, right. then you've encountered what it's like to come of age and realize that the very language and stories and things you tell yourself where you have those big conversations and think about your decisions and actions, that they weren't value neutral. You're born into a world where you learn language and rhythms and rituals and signs and stories and what it's like to be a family, right? Like just like any of us, we think when we get married, every house ran like the one we were born in <laughs> and they don't. No, right? no. And then there's this like train wreck and hopefully beautiful things happen. Um, yep. This, but, but the same is true, right? About our deep values of meaning and purpose and such. Yep. And when you've transitioned, then you're able to see that those deep values can exist and you can move beyond them, but they're also the very uh, resources and reservoir for figuring out mm. the spaces of transition, right? Because the yeah. past is going to be there. So it's how you relate to it. What yeah. parts of it are you recognizing as blessings? What parts of it are curses? And, yes. uh, as, and, and as someone wrestling with what being a Southerner and a preacher's kid from the South in the context mm. where white supremacy is more clear, that changes. But the like you become more clear about it. But if you're talking with your friends and family, so many times when you have this like new breakthrough, what Whitehead calls the romantic moment, right? Where this new realization all of a sudden envelops the whole world and everything's entailed in it. Then the way you come across to other people is as if they have to experience the whole world as you're experiencing it. Otherwise they need to reject you and separate from you or just capitulate. Mm -hmm. And I think that we don't do that is important. Yeah. And so then your question is, how do you engage and talk to someone so that you are affirming parts of what they're, they're receiving and how are you lifting certain elements up exactly. and how are you helping to problematize the right things? And if you are attentive to that, the thing I've discovered is that even someone you think is dead wrong can do the same to you. Yes. Yes. I, and, I'm, I let me, let me be very vulnerable for a moment and talk about a conversation I just had a few weeks ago with my brother who is much more on the right than I am on these things. And it was exactly that kind of conversation in which I listened carefully to him, maybe not listen as well as I would like to have, but I did my very best trying to tease out aspects of what he had to say that I could grasp onto and build from, knowing that as an open relational thinker, there's no way I'm going to force my ideas on him. He's got to be open to them. So I have to lure him. I have to uh, make them attractive. My ideas have to woo him in some kind of way. They have to be persuasive. And not just my ideas. I think a whole lot of social scientists are um, emphasizing the notion that it's not ideas that typically change people. It's the kind of relationships in which those ideas are formed. And so I have to look to my brother right in the eye and love him in the best way I know how to love him, despite having some radically different views about politics and Donald Trump in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think there's a, um, one of the elements of an open relational vision is it's uh, practicality in the way yeah. it, it, in its livability in a sense. Yep. Um, so one of the other questions that came in was, uh, uh, about scripture. So, uh, it said, I'm very interested in open relational and process like thinking, um, how do you frame or reframe, uh, elements in scripture that are more hierarchical or sound immutable in, in particular parts? And uh, which ones do you, how do you lift up the more relational passages over those? Um, so, and, and I think that's a, I mean, I think it's a, it's a reasonable question and it shows just like the necessary role of hermeneutics. And I think yeah. part of, part, part of a transition into a type of faith where you have to take ownership for your theologizing is one that mm -hmm. recognizes 
uh, it's there's hermeneutics all the way down, right? Then you can't get out of it, right? Yeah, and this is not just a, an issue for open and relational thinkers. Mm -hmm. It's an issue for everybody. It's just that I think open and relational thinkers have some resources with which they can uh, address these questions. I think I want to take that question and and refer to the kind of questions I often get when I talk about my God can't view. Mm -hmm. um, that is, some people will say to me, hold on a second, you're saying God can't single-handedly stop evil. Well, I read the Bible, they'll say, and the God of the Bible single-handedly does all kinds of things. And uh, the God of the Bible doesn't always act very loving. Um, you know, what, what's going on there? And I, I like to respond by distinguishing between two ideas. One does the Bible explicitly say God controls others or creation? And I don't think there's a single passage in the entire Bible from the creation of the world to hardening Pharaoh's heart, to the miracles, to the resurrection of Jesus, to the eschatological fulfillment. None of those explicitly say God controlled or will control others in the sense of being a sufficient cause. The second question, though, well, is on that point, Tom, I'll yeah, just say yeah. it was w when you said that I just assumed for years like that it's just like an argument in scripture and that I just think one side's wrong. Like, and yeah. then you said that I went looking right. This is <laughs> like, it, I don't even disagree with you. I yeah, just went yeah. looking because like they, they, there are real arguments in scripture, right? Like um, about the. Uh, uh, of something like there are arguments about the sovereignty of God, ultimate sovereignty of God. Sure. Like you can sure. see different pictures. There's arguments about the role of uh, worship and cult, cult, cultic life in Israel or the king, whether there should be one. Like there are some real arguments, right? And yeah. anyway, this one I assumed was one of those. You're like, I can't find a place in the Bible. And I'm like, really? You can't? Because in my head, I learned it in the context of people that thought that was definitely the case. So me I went too. back through, you made me more biblical and more open and relational. <laughs> I love it. Well, what a lot of people will do is they'll, they'll take me up on this challenge and they'll find some passage of scripture that only mentions God acting. And they'll say, well, there you go. Here's an example. And I'll say, hold on a second. Does it say that God was the only actor? Does it eliminate any kind of possibility of cooperation? And they don't. And one of the things I've been doing lately, and I do this actually in this new book, Questions and Answers for God Can't, is I also point out passages in which humans do important loving things like miracles, and God is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, 99 theologians out of 100 will look at a passage, let's say where the St. Peter is walking along and someone touches the hem of his garment or the, his handkerchiefs and they get healed and God is not mentioned at all. 99% of theologians will say, well, even though God isn't mentioned, God was present there because you have to have God for the miracle. And I agree with them. But they're not willing to say when instances in which only God is mentioned that creatures played some role. And I want to say what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're going to have an overall understanding, uh, philosophical, metaphysical, uh, biblical notion of how God acts and creatures respond, we ought to think about miracles as always involving God's initiating, empowering, but also some kind of creaturely response or some kind of contribution, even at the inanimate levels of creation. It, it, it's like you're suggesting that moment to moment, every event is the fruit of God and the world interacting. Yes, right. Yes. Actually, I, I wanted to say one other thing about uh, scripture because I want to make two points. The other one was this. Um, some people say, look, Tom, there are some biblical passages that do not portray God as loving. What do you do with those? I think that's a harder issue. I agree. There are some passages that portray God as unloving. Uh, you know, the one I like to cite is when the, uh, the writers think that God wants them to take the babies from their enemies and bash those heads against the rocks. Um, when I was a young person and I was sort of toying with inerrancy and I wanted to have a perfectly systematic theology in the Bible, 
I would try to squint at those kind of passages and kind of feel, well, maybe from the divine perspective, you know, killing babies is loving, you know, like I, I tried to make that work, but I never could do it. And I've kind of just to a place in my life now where I just say, look, there are some portrayals of God in scripture that are just wrong. I say that because in light of the whole scripture, in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ, in light of fundamental moral intuitions that almost every human has. Um, so while I think the preponderance of scripture points to a loving God, and I have no, of no passages that explicitly say God controls, I have to admit that there are some passages that don't support perfect divine love. All right. So uh, the next question, question four. I'm, I'm impressed we made it to four questions, Tom. <laughs> I'm trying to stay, be short, short here. All right. So question four, um, if you could eliminate one doctrine from the history of the church that never showed up. And so like, think like, not like which is the worst, but if you just took it out, like you, you went back in time and took it out like a, like a, one of the, one of the infinity stones. Yeah. And then you're undoing the, uh, the ugliness that follows. Which one are you going to uh, eliminate? Well, I think the, typical Christian view of God's power has done the most damage, but I wouldn't say that that's ever been like a formalized doctrine. It, it seems like it's kind of been an intuition. And so people have said God is almighty and created, and they just assume that God had a particular kind of power. So I don't think I'm going to go with the power one. I think I'm going to go. Okay. Here's a controversial one. Um, the more controversy thought, yeah <laughs> the more i have thought about the doctrine of the virgin birth the more i think it has undermined the idea that humans are intrinsically good um and maybe it's kind of a long way to work around this but uh, it seems like a lot of people, especially Augustine, wanted to latch on to a particular understanding of the virgin birth to be able to say that Jesus didn't have a sin nature like all the rest of us do, and therefore he could be sinless while the rest of us are sorry suckers bound for sin and we're inherently depraved. I mean, it's it's cashed out in a lot of different ways, but um, I wonder if that doctrine had been set aside, if... Uh, we wouldn't have developed the sin nature views that I think have given us such a negative view of people. Now, I, I readily admit people sin, people do rotten things. I've done rotten things in my life. I'm not discounting sin at all. But this whole sin nature thing, I think, has really wrecked havoc uh, in Christianity. No, I, I, yeah, that makes, in, and that, like, that doctrine gets supported by the way in which a very powerful and active female in the story uh, get like Mary is a powerful figure in the New Testament, and then wow. to be utilized for that purpose kind of uh, you know undoes some of the uh, 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 inertia her, yeah. her her character in the text has. I wonder, here's a science question. I wonder if Augustine and others, if they had known about uh, chromosomes and the contribution of eggs and sperm, I wonder if they had gone the same direction in seemingly dismissing Mary's physical contribution to Jesus's personhood. Um, this is obviously wild speculation, but if you have a particular notion that the whole of the person is in the sperm, then you can have a virgin birth that has a divine Jesus who's kind of only semi-human. Um, anyway, this is a well, rabbit trail. We're getting nerdy. You can also scientifically have a virgin birth today that doesn't True enough. the incarnation. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so it, I... I I'd have to spend more time before I gave a final answer to this because okay. given it came on Twitter. Um, uh, I think 
the the thing I would resist is the Protestant collapsing of faith to assent. Um, that Interesting. What faith means is a list of things you believe. Gotcha. Oh, propositions because, that you yeah, mentally assent because, to. Yeah. Um, I think, and this is something I've been reading a lot about recently like there are ways propositions that i just find utterly problematic yeah uh, if i'm assessing them are yeah. performed in ways that are strikingly beautiful mm. and that's what really kind of like sent me off on this this quest but i think it shows up in a lot of places the more people i've interacted with you know via the people who reach out to me in the podcast have this deep anxiety about their faith because of what's going through their head. Yeah. And, you know, like the only people in the New Testament that are wonderfully confident about what's going through their head, like especially if you read the Gospels, like the demons have like the identity of Jesus down pat. <laughs> the disciples don't know who the hell he is. And then they, they even get his name right. Like, oh, you're the Christ, son of the living God. And then like two chapters mm-hmm. later, Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan, because yeah. what Jesus is invested in is the actual character of the community and lives lived out. And I feel like we, uh, it, in Protestantism, and it, you know, it's connected to a shift in epistemologies and the, the turn to the subject, and there's a whole lot of reasons. Sure, right? but it disembodies the faith, it decommunalizes the faith. And then it puts all this energy that's connected to religion to what you believe is true or not at a given moment. Yeah. And like, if what was ultimately true needed your assent to it, that's scary. The other side is like, if that was what Jesus was most worried about worst teacher ever, he has, (laughs) he has some of the greatest stories of all time that have more dissertations written explaining how the previous dissertations were wrong than anyone ever. Yeah, like, yeah. And, and, and I just wish you could, like, if you took that out, then all of a sudden what it means to believe something isn't like a true false test. Right. Right. It's like a, a love poem that dis- demands response. And I feel like, and I would, hear you. You're not dismissing uh, belief or intellectual assent altogether. I hear mm-hmm. you saying what you're dismissing is sort of you're in if you affirm these nine propositions. <laughs> kind of a thing. Yeah, and I I have a hard time with that too. You yeah. know, I used to kind of make fun of well, make fun is too strong. I used to not understand. Yeah, you're too nice. I would have made fun. <laughs> I used to not understand Christians I knew who didn't believe in God but went to church because they like the aesthetics. But then, <laughs> you were like, I don't get this. Yeah, I don't get it at all. I still think a person ought to believe in God, but I, I now... You haven't, been to, you haven't been to the UK recently. Yeah. I, I now have a great more sympathy for folks who are in that particular position. And strangely enough, one of the things that made me more sympathetic was realizing that there's some kind of music that I like... Uh, In my background, I would have called it secular music, Uh, music that I like, that I don't particularly buy into the words, but there's something about the beauty of the music that I just want to go along with. And and seeing that in myself and others have made me had a greater appreciation for people who appreciate the aesthetics of a particular kind of worship service, even though they don't buy the the beliefs that are preached. Mm -hmm. All right. Question five, what's the open and relational account of the kingdom of God? That's a biggie, isn't it? Let me, uh, let me start going at this. You and I could talk for hours on this one. Uh, let me start with saying that I have been thinking about what I'm calling a civilization of love. Mm-hmm. After having been influenced by some of the work that um, Philip Clayton and Andrew Schwartz are doing in their ecological civilization, they have a, 
uh, some important work being done uh, around ecology and thinking big picture, like not just how I should change my life or how my community should change my life or how even my country ought to be different, but how civilization itself ought to be different in light of the climate crisis and other things. And as I've been thinking about that in light of the kingdom of God, I've seen lots of parallels, except that given my emphasis upon love, I want to use more explicit love language. So maybe one way to answer that question in a really brief way is to say, the kingdom of God for me looks like a civilization in which love is central and characterizes economics, education, um, friendships, uh, how we treat plant, uh, animals, how we treat enemies, uh, a civilization of love is the kind of language that I'm gravitating toward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's really helpful. The, um, I mean, I, it, I can't, I don't remember who sent this question in, but I have a, quite a bit about it in my last Jesus book. Um, so I'll just, the, the two things that have come up since then, well, the thing in that book that's funny is I always say kingdom and drop the G. Yes. Right. Right. And, and part of it is because kingdom has this hierarchical thing and it's a king, right. it's a dude, patriarchy. Yeah. And uh, Jesus prioritizes the uh, parental imagery of God over the judicial legal image yeah. and the hierarchical right? Like uh, imperial image. And I think if Jesus is uh, correct, if God's, if God's like Jesus, then Abba is judge, which means you're not getting assessed for murder, trial, and eternal damnation, but adopted into the divine life. And nice. if, uh, if Abba is king, then you are part of the royal family, right? And yeah. so uh, kingdom of God was in part this like political jab at the powers that be that killed him. And so I, to, to emphasize the rejection of hierarchy and patriarchy, I get rid of the G and say kingdom, right? Like the family of God. Um, and, and I, I've joked uh, that uh, if you drop, if Abba says drop the G is the name of the chapter. Um, it gets rid of the cock and the crown. Right, and patriarchy and hierarchy. Ooh, that's uh, nice. Yeah, and 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 I think and I think it's important. And it's fun if you're a minister to say kingdom all the time, and then someone yeah. notices and asks. Yeah, and then yeah. you say, "Well, Abba says drop the G," and then they're like, "What?" You know, and you yeah. you do that whole a whole riff. Um, but are you familiar with the the pushback to kingdom? I mean, there's some people who think that it doesn't give God enough leadership status. Um, I, I once used that and someone said, kingdom, you mean we're all family. There's no leaders. Uh, that's too egalitarian for me. I, I wanna... Maybe they had a real egalitarian family. You should have, <laughs> maybe you could have done some social science research. Maybe. <laughs> you, were, you, you could have added it to your altruism book. You, there you're you like, go. we finally found it. <laughs> An actual family with perfect perfectly reciprocal good. equality. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, you, I, you, once, uh, I once posed the question to a bunch of my newsletter uh, followers, you know, what would be your alternative to the kingdom of God? And I was just surprised. Uh, people have been thinking about this. I bet I had 25 responses that were all over the board. Uh, kingdom was one. And I put that up and it really got some strong negative pushback. Yeah. I've always found uh, the pushback to be revelatory of uh, growing edges and the pushbacker. That's been my experience. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, and, and I was a minister, you know, in congregation for a long time and I've had the conversation with quite a few people and, and it, uh, and then I say like, well, do you like Commonwealth of God better? Do you want me to say it in Greek? Like, yeah. you know, and I start giving other options. And I was like, you, and, and the best part is if you decide to follow up with your minister because they didn't say a G, that means you've already judged them and you're just looking for ammo, right? So, <laughs> Probably. And so they're just like, well, I know you're just a secret cultural Marxist in this church, right? Like, and, 
and you're yeah. you're like, I got rid of the G, and then you explain it as if like I'm just trying to communicate to people that don't get the revolutionary nature of Jesus and his, and the key, the coming presence and reality of God conflicts with the imperial structure and oppressive religious regime. Like, would you rather me say Jesus is my commander in chief? Like, who? What? What would work? You know, in yeah. most of like me saying the Bible stuff followed by a desire to be biblical uh, leads them being coming much more comfortable with something they know their friends won't notice than yeah, yeah. like going and saying, you know, so-and-so came to my office. He was concerned. It's almost always a he. Uh, that <laughs> I said kingdom of God, not kingdom. So uh, in order, at, we discussed the Bible for a while and and I told him, I said, well, we just have to be clear. Jesus probably has a strong commitment against neoliberal capitalism and the perversion <laughs> of our nation state and the role we play in the economic and political and military order of our globe. And considering that our consumption patterns, even present within each of us, are leading to the degradation of the planet. We are now going to pray to our commander in chief. <laughs> like, I'm impressed yeah. that someone actually noticed the kingdom stuff. I, I remember when I was in graduate school and I decided I was going to shift and only use gender neutral pronouns when talking about God. And I would preach. And I, when I read scripture, I, I wouldn't do it. But rest of the time, I would do that. And I tell you, very few people ever noticed that. <laughs> I don't know if they just weren't listening to me at all, or if I did it in such a smooth way that it didn't arise. But, you know, I don't think anybody came up to me and said, you're not talking about God as he anymore. What's going on? Uh, so Yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Well, I don't want to get derailed. But I do think they're <laughs> like part of the reason people don't notice is because unless you're explicit, the ideology reigns. And I know a lot of ministers who have tried to transition right by being subtle. Yeah. And then unless it's stated explicitly, then they feel realize they lost half their congregation and the other half is mad at it. And this yeah. shows up not just on that issue, but like uh, LGBT inclusion, all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so when it goes to, like, and I think that's, if you think about the open relational part of what it means to the kingdom of God, it does mean, to have clear convictions and define yourself in right. relationship to the present. And then the kingdom of God is the recognition that in each moment, each moment is a gift of grace yeah, and that you get to cooperate. And each moment comes with the judgment of the kingdom and then yeah. the assessment of what's come to be. And then grace happens and you're given a new moment. And so I tell you, the kingdom I, to me is that is the rhythm of the divine life and our place in it. I like that a lot. Uh, I, I often, when I talk about love, people assume something like extreme relativism, like anything goes, no convictions, you know, just everybody ought to have, uh, think one idea is just as good as another. Um, I don't know why this is. Why is it that in our society, love means anything goes? I, it's not what I mean. And it's not what open relational thinkers typically mean either. I mean, we're also not being coercive and oppressive, but um, we need to have convictions about things that really matter because what really matters matters also to God. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So the last question was, what are three books you're currently reading or recently read that weren't bad? <laughs> that weren't bad. Let's see. Well, um, I'm reading Keith Ward's Partakers of the Divine Nature, which is an argument for idealism mm -hmm. um, that I'm really liking. Uh, last night, before I went to bed, I read a book. I think I have it here next to me. Oh, maybe not. Maybe I, I moved it called something about chaos and it's by Andre Rabe, who's a uh, South African theologian. And he's combining Rene Girard's mimetic theory with an open and relational perspective. Oh, cool. And uh, then I've been spending a lot of time with this really interesting book called uh, divine self investment by this trip fuller guy. 
<laughs> because uh, it's uh, coming out uh, fairly soon. And uh, I've been reading about the Christologies and the way he works through various major uh, theologians and the, he gleans insights from various folks on the way to constructing his own open and relational uh, Christology. So you might check that guy out. Well, you know, that was such a solid pitch. I would buy five copies. <laughs> oh, you ought to. <laughs> All right. So my three are, oh, hold on. I got to turn off my background. Virtual background doesn't like book covers, but Elgin we go. is asleep behind me. So uh, um, for my people, uh, Black uh, Theology in the Black Church by James Cone is I've part of our that. Black Theology reading group right now. And honestly, if you're new to reading Black Theology, it's a great book because it gives the history and his own hot takes oh. Um, oh. when you're when you're going through it. Um, a uh, uh, Gary Dorian recommendation, Nature, Ooh, Man, and God yes. by William Temple. Yes, um, I read sections of that. I, I am upset that no one told me about this earlier. Uh, there the Christology section in it is strikingly similar to a lot of things I did in the book you just mentioned. Yeah. And I'm like, how do I not know about William Temple? And then I find out on top of being this British idealist who modified Hegel with Whitehead's metaphysics, he also was Archbishop of Canterbury and uh, was Archbishop during the emergence of uh, their social democracy, their, like their big social safety net, was the advocate for introducing the NHS and all sorts of things here. Didn't know and, that, huh? Um, was popular. Anyway, I was like, this is a high quality guy. And then the last one, and I'm not a lot of people have read this. Everyone I know that has read it, loved it, is A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None. Never um, heard of it. Uh, Catherine Yusoff? Catherine Yusoff. It's. So it's a, it, this whole series is cool. This little um, University of Minnesota Press does it. Uh, they, they're small books, and you know they're like, I don't know, 80 pages, 100 pages. And the whole is they're like between an article and like a whole work that's like a live idea they're wrestling with. Um, and the book is an exploration of how uh, we assume certain disciplines describe the world neutrally. And, she, and she's using geology is not neutral tracing it. Uh, and, and so she used it to talk about Anthropocenes and then even how like you try to inscribe the whole world on one Anthropocene is problematic. So a billion black Anthropocenes are none. Um, so it's like an exploration of the, the grammar of geology um, in huh. the way it uh, is connected to all sorts of historical movements and changes like colonialism, slavery, and all these things that, um, entailed in the way we describe the world is this regime of power. Uh, and Very interesting. And, you know, what's fascinating about it, um, this is might be the most nerdy thing ever. So just today, I, fi I finished rereading um, Whitehead's uh, lectures on, uh, on uh, philosophy of nature. Hmm. And in his... Um, um, in, in the last two chapters on the ultimate principles of nature and well, whatever the other one's called, he talks, he's talking about the way in which um, uh, con, like the way you conceive, and this is before he has the term prehension, uh, conceive the whole in a moment of experience, all of nature is present and the, like, obviously the prehension of everything and then the possibilities of nature are present and what is presented to you and so like an event is a happening of nature and then he wants to delineate like in the interiority of an individual event which is the seat of your subjectivity and it overlaps with other events and all that kind of stuff right um uh he he gives the example of he gives two examples of uh as as rejecting the way um, kind of an arch rationalist looks at possibilities. He goes, mm -hmm. when you read Hamlet and you get to to be or not to be, a logician is not fit 
to understand that proposition. Nice. Right? Like <laughs> in, it's, it's coming in a play. It's in a play. Right? In the whole soliloquy of Hamlet, it's this exploration of finitude and meaning and all this kind of stuff. And to get it right, right, like whatever that means, yeah. is so different than a syllogism. Right. It yep. involves it and you know, he's trying to get at how in a moment of becoming you can't rip value out of it. Right. Because a part of the value is precisely the the eruption of feeling, the possibilities that are latent in a moment. Yes. And in to be or not to be is not a binary that truth sits in. It is a demand for feeling for this intensity of feeling. And then he uses the next example. He uses his uh, uh, Waterloo. And he talks about how historians will talk about everything that goes into Waterloo and everything that had to go right, blah, 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 blah. And then he goes, and the problem is what when you a physicist tells you about Waterloo, they might actually think the whole thing was ordered from the whole beginning. <laughs> right in the whole telling of waterloo is connected to how all these contingencies line up and yet this whole of contingencies cannot contain everything that came into being through this one battle nice. in fact you could tell a uh not a utopia a you whatever the word is i looked it up on google um for a, an alternative timeline right like uh uh, Philip K. Dick does for the Nazis winning World War II. Oh, okay. Um, and Man in a High Castle, and 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 so like he postulates that and goes, and the reason that whole thing's there is because one of all these possibilities, they're all valued in different ways for different centers of subjectivity, and so there's this like propensity of feeling, and they're all connected, and the biggest problem we have. Just in the same of science, right? If you bifurcate nature and you reduce everything to objects in mass bumping into each other, the yeah. same problem is the way you tell history, mm. right? Like all of a sudden a map is value neutral. Yeah, and so yeah. this book connects That's with about, that because ah. it's looking at it at the level of geology and goes like, what if um, the world we have is not like value neutral? It is the product of things like Waterloo. It is yeah. the con context for this feeling for to be or not to be is not really a binary. It's an invitation. Anyway, like anyway, that I, was like I literally my cigar while reading time today. <laughs> and you heard my thoughts about it. So <laughs> that's beautiful. And, and I'm sure that's what uh, inspired ABBA to do their Waterloo song, bringing all of that together. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. sorry I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> and so all of a sudden people that are too young are like abba are we talking yeah. about like, so, that's that john cobb book right uh, it was a uh, band yep you it's abba all caps caps like abba <laughs> That's awesome. good stuff. You know, it is fun to share what we've been reading because um, I think you know, to, to bring this back to open a relational thinking, uh, I mean, you, you're doing that already, but uh, part of what I enjoy most about a vision in open and relational terms is that the future is truly open. The past has real influence and I can be a different person tomorrow because I've prehended, I've gathered in new information and ideas that uh, it, at their best transform my world in positive ways. And books have been a really important part of that for me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, that was fun. So I yeah. hope everybody who who's joined us um, goes check out whichever book after they get mine. Um, that sounds interesting and uh we should do it again we should do a whole podcast where we pick multiple books and we pick our favorite passage we read it to the other one and discuss it for like five or six minutes and go to the next one yeah that's actually something i'm doing with my doctoral students we meet once a month and in addition to sort of saying a little bit about their lives i'm asking them to to read a short passage from a book that they've been reading and it's a lot of fun just to kind of see what things people choose because it tells you a little bit about who they are and their values. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And, uh, and the, the billion black anthropocenes or none book, uh, Jacob Erickson 
recommended it to me. Jake oh. was a Catherine Keller student. He's in Ireland at uh, yeah in Dublin right now, and so I accidentally ordered it, and it was delivered to my house or in the states. So oh. then my dad got it. He read it, and he's like, "I don't know why this book got delivered here. This is great." Like, yeah. and I'm like, "What is it?" And I was like, "Oh, I meant to get it here." So, um, <laughs> it, it, so even my dad liked. So that's like a a double double cool. affirmation. Um, yeah. So thanks for everyone for for uh, hanging out, especially if you send in a question. Um, sure, y'all can send in more because Tom and I'll talk again. Um, it's not hard to lure us to hang out. Yeah. And, thanks uh, a lot, Trip. I've enjoyed it. Oh yeah. And, and you should say your, your website one last time. So everyone can. Find sure. You. Um, well, my personal website is my full name, Thomas J Ord. And the, that's a J A Y O O R D Thomas J com. But the uh, Northwind theological seminary site, it's probably just easiest if you Google that and you'll find uh, that. All righty. So see y'all later.